Hi class, welcome to Illustrator Lab 9. Um, today you're going to need the file symbolforest.ai. Um, we are going to do some review of our freeform gradient and pattern brush tools, as well as our pen and width tool. Then we're going to learn how to use symbols, and then we'll use our scale tool in order to change some of those, get some variety. And overall, our entire lesson is about composition. Right, when you're ready, go ahead and launch that. All right, now you're going to have a slightly different version of the file than mine because what I'm going to do right now is go through all of the steps, part one, part two, three, and four um, of your lab. And I'm just going to read them to you and demonstrate here on my screen using what I've already created. Um, so if you just want to pause and just relax for a minute and just watch, um, you will be kind of doing everything I'm about to show you on your own after the video has ended. All right, so... Mine says it's the instructor draft. I have a lot of extra layers here. You do not need to build in these extra layers. All you need is layer one and layer two to build your illustration. Okay, that being said, let's go ahead and start in. So on part one, we are gonna create a map of a forest and we have to start with the map base. So this is kind of the color and topography, the very basics um, beneath all the goings on. So in step A, we are asked to create a rectangle that covers the artboard and fill it with a free form gradient that includes the following color swatches. We have lakeside green, plains green, and dry green. All right, so if I turn on this layer over here, one step 1A, notice that we have a rectangle and even extends a little bit beyond our artboard. And if I go ahead and select that and hit hotkey G for gradient, you can see my different color stops of my lakeside, plains and dry green. Now you do not have to put yours in the same place. In fact, I don't even want you to. I don't want you to try to duplicate what I've done. I want you to come up with uh, a variation, your own map. All right, so if that means you want more um, or you want to place them in different areas, that's fine. But go ahead and use those three color swatches to create a rectangle with a free form gradient. All right. Your next step, once you have that rectangle with kind of that basic set of colors, is to use the pen tool to draw a lake shape where the gradient is lakeside green. So wherever you put this kind of lakeside green area of your rectangle, which for me is kind of this upper left, for you it could be the center or a side or the bottom, um, you're going to draw that lake shape, fill it with the blue swatch. This is the lake color. All right. Once you're done with building that, you're gonna copy the shape and eye drop the shadow color swatch, then adjust that second shape to look like a shoreline. Now this is what that looks like. So for me, my lakeside green was kind of up in this area, really, really dark green. This is because the more water, the more is available for plants to grow. So here's where my lake is. This is that shape that I drew with the pen tool, very simple. It might even bleeds off the edge of my map. Yours can, or if you want to keep it entirely in your map, that's fine. Now this is that secondary shape, that shadow color, all right? So what I did is I copied my lake shape, Command C, Command F, and then I just gave it a little bit of a stretch and a little bit of a scale so that it wasn't completely parallel, um, but it kind of feels like a wet shore or maybe even like a little bit of a hill into the lake. All right, so that is 1B. All right, step 1C is to duplicate these objects, so we've got three objects here, onto the artboard. So by duplicating them, I just mean like literally hold down your Option key or your Alt key and bring them onto your artboard. Um, for you, you're gonna bring them onto layer one. All this stuff is already on layer one, so you shouldn't accidentally bring it onto the wrong layer. Mine's layered differently, so that's why they didn't show up. Um, but you're gonna bring them onto your artboard, then you're gonna move them duplicate them and resize them to add some subtle variety to the topography. All right, it's gonna look kind of splotchy like this. All right, so some of them are cutting in from the sides. Some of them are even stacked on top of others, but they're just these kind of just large organic shapes that kind of just help it feel a little bit more varied, a little less flat. All right, now at this point, if it kind of bothers you to see the stuff hanging off the edges, you can build in a layer that kind of has a fake uh, mask, so to speak. Um, we're gonna come all the way up to the top here and add a new layer. You can add this layer too, um, if it 
kind of makes you feel better. Um, I'm gonna eye drop this gray of my background of the software and then create a rectangle that covers my artboard. And then a rectangle that kind of exceeds it, goes around it. I'm gonna move the second one backwards by holding down Command and tapping my left bracket key. And then using my Pathfinder tool minus front to create a window, a hole. Now in this layer, I'm just gonna keep it locked. That way I don't have to worry about seeing it ever again. All right, so this one is just, because it's on top, it's just blocking out all that extra stuff that's off to the side. We don't have to look at it anymore. Okay, so that was step one C. So we kind of added some topography. Next, we're asked to duplicate this piece of footpath next to the artboard. That means hold down option and go ahead and bring it next to the artboard somewhere. All right, then you're gonna use your pen tool. You know, if you have your pen tool over the end of it, you can continue building on that piece of path um, so that it tracks over the land and exits off to one side. All right, so you can decide to start your path um, on the left or the right or the top or the bottom. Um, so long as both ends of your path, I'll turn on the layer now, as long as both ends of your path come off of your artboard. We want to imply that this world is much bigger than what we're seeing through this rectangle window. So go ahead by starting a path on or outside one end and then ending at outside another, you're gonna kind of imply that this goes on. This is not totally contained. And again, I don't want you to try to duplicate mine. Um, go ahead and build a different path. You can even build more than one path if you want there to be a couple different forks in the road, etc. All right. Once you've uh, finished with step D, you're gonna go on to step E, which is to create a pattern brush of this group of footprints. Recall your pattern brushes here in this drop down menu. Once you have a group of objects selected, you can go ahead and hit this plus sign and adjust the nature of your path. Now, they don't look much like footprints, but at the size that we need them to be, which is very small, you know, those our path even had some variable width. If you looked at the widths, we had some different width bars. Um, we're gonna put little footprints that also follow this path. And we want them to follow like little depressions in the ground. That's what these are supposed to represent. All right, so once you've created the pattern brush where this repeats forever, you're gonna duplicate your footpath shape. So it's this shape here that you just drew using your footpath piece there. And then you're gonna switch that path to be your new pattern brush. All right, let me zoom in here. So this is the pattern brush. So we see little footprints everywhere. So don't feel like you have to redraw that path with your pen tool. You're just gonna duplicate your footpath and then fill it instead with that pattern brush tool so that it follows the whole way. This will kind of denote that it is a path, not just maybe uh, an old river or a low area in your map. All right, after step one E, we have one F. Create a pattern brush, so another pattern brush, out of this river group, all right? So this is a pair of objects that is grouped together. It is the river swatch and the shadow swatch. So the shadow swatch is just right behind a little bar of river, all right? Once you've created your pattern brush, you're gonna draw a winding river over the map using your pen tool. You're gonna make sure it crosses the footpath at least once. So I'm going to show you that right now. Here we have a path filled with a pattern brush. I can turn off my, uh, my pretend to mask layer. That starts and ends off of my artboard. And it crosses my footpath once, twice, three times. So it needs to cross at least once. All right, so then you're going to use the width tool that shift W to create a variable width profile of thins and thicks. It makes it feel a little bit more organic. If this were just a uniform width, it would look pretty boring and static. So we wanted to add those widths to our path to make it feel like in areas that it is compressed or flows a little more freely. All right, once you're finished with the river, 
you're going to use your footprints pattern brush. So the one that you created in step E, you're going to add small pieces of path over the river and lake to appear like ripples or fish. All right, and that's what this looks like. This is a small piece of path using that pattern brush tool. So is this right here? It could look like swimming fish or maybe shadows of rocks or ripples in the water. I like to think they're fish. I think that'd be fun. All right. Now you may need to change the stroke width from one point to 0.5 or 0.75 um, in order to see it really well. All right. So this is a one point stroke. This one's a little bit too big to put in an area of a small stretch of river so to change your stroke width. Okay, that is your entire map base. So when you're done with that, you can lock layer one for now and then move on to layer two. This is where it's gonna to start to get really fun. All this groundwork just kind of gets us ready for the really fun stuff, all right? So in step two, part two, it's called make camp. All right, this is where we're gonna learn how to use symbols. So up till this point, we've been kind of using what we already know. 2A asks us to convert the following groups of objects into symbols by selecting them and dragging them into the symbols window. Every time you need a window, you can come up here to window and find it from your drop-down menu, symbols. Mine's up here, I'll grab it in a second. Um, so you can either select a group and drag them into the symbols window or have it selected and click the plus sign in the symbols window. So let's open that up and look at it. Mine contains all of these symbols already because I've already done this illustration. But every time you have an object and hit the plus sign or click and drag it into your swatches window, excuse me, symbols window, it will ask you to create a new one and you will name it after the object. I'm gonna call this one inventory box. I'm gonna keep its preset default settings. I'm gonna say okay. All right, you notice now that your group of objects doesn't have the paths showing anymore when you select it. It just has this little crosshairs, this little plus sign. This is just to indicate that this is now no longer um, a group of objects. This is a symbol. I can't use my hotkey A and edit any of these little individual pieces um, without going into the symbol itself and editing it in there. So this is a lot like our swatches palette when you build patterns. All right, so you would have to double click on a pattern in your swatches palette in order to edit it. All right. Now, if ever you have created a symbol out of something and you really need to be able to edit it, you can break the link to the symbol by right clicking on the object and breaking the link. And you'll return to the normal pieces of vector information of the illustration. Now the reason that we're using symbols at all today is because you will in your careers have to build a really large very complex illustration um, where you will have so many small components and the file size is going to add up very quickly every time it has to remember a path especially if you're repeating objects which we will soon. So by, be by creating a symbol we can reduce the file size and increase the amount of speed that we have in our program or um, the efficiency of how we share and export our files. All right. It's much like using a pattern tool to repeat a bunch of shapes forever instead of repeating the same shapes forever. All right. It saves us memory, it saves us space, it saves us time, it saves us stress. All right. So step 1A is to create a symbol out of every one of these groups. So you're going to select this one and either hit the plus sign and call it fire pit. Oh, and I already have one that name. I think I've already done this illustration. I'll just call it fire. And then this one, which is a tent or a shelter. And then this one, which is a nice little sitting log. All right. Now you can name them whatever you like, whatever makes sense to you. But once they're all of them symbols, we are asked to place a symbol of each of these groups close together in an area of your map near the footpath. All right, so we're gonna make camp. This is our little campground. It needs to include these four things. 
So if we go over to our map, and you should be on layer two now. So you can lock layer one, which has all the background stuff. I chose this area down here near the bottom. All right. Set up my tent, my fire pit, my inventory box, and my little sitting space. All right, once you've done that, you're going to convert the falling group into a symbol and place it on the lake. We have a sailing raft. All right, so again, you're going to select this object, hit the plus sign, or click and drag it into your symbols window. I think mine is, oh, look, here it is right here. And then once it's in there, you can actually drag a version of that from your symbols window into an area of the artboard. Now I'm dragging it into a layer that's behind everything. Um, but you can drag them in from here instead of having to collect them from where you've created them. That's what makes this so handy is they all exist right here now. All right. So we have our little sailing raft to make. And then also we're going to convert these three kind of sets of logs, these bridges, um, into symbols, and then place them wherever the footpath crosses the river. Now to complete this whole set, we've got a lot of cut logs that we have to explain on our map. So we'll convert the following little illustrations into symbols, and we're going to place them near Bridges, Camp, and the Lakeshore to explain how we got these logs. We had to cut down trees. All right, so I'm going to turn on this layer here to reveal that. So we have a bridge where a footpath crosses the river here, a bridge where the footpath crosses over here, and a bridge here. Now, if your footpath and bridge cross at a very, very different angle than any of mine, you're welcome to edit these logs before you turn them into a symbol. Um, once you turn them into a symbol, you can scale them, uh, but you couldn't necessarily use your uh, direct selection tool to move pieces of path to make it a little bit more convincing. All right, so we have a raft. We have some cut trees near our bridges and camp. All right, that's it for part two. That's it for making camp. All right, now is when we're going to start making quite the forest out of this. Um, you're still going to stay in layer two because some of these things are going to need to overlap each other. But part three is called grow a forest. All right, so you are going to make symbols out of these rocks out of the trees, out of the bushes, and then out of the grass and these little stones. All right. I want you to do them in order. I want you to do the rocks first. All right. Um, you're going to want to, because these are all very uniform in size, you're going to want to make some really big and you're going to want some, want to make some large and medium and small. So we get a lot of very natural variation. The trees already come in some pretty natural variation, but you're welcome to resize those symbols once you've placed them inside your artboard as well, so you can get more. Um, that goes for our bushes as well. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what happens when we add steps A, B, and C onto our artboard. So we have camp made, and now we're going to add trees rocks and bushes. This is going to look like a lot and it's going to take you a minute to do it too. All right. So I just want you to notice that there is a huge variation in the size of these rocks. They're not all the same medium size. Some of them have been flipped horizontally. So you can size and rotate. I wouldn't recommend rotating since everything here has to be kind of upright. But you can size and rotate and mirror or reflect symbols. Um, and that's how you can get some good variation using only just a few assets. All right, so we have medium, small, and big. I'm going to place them around, and then you're going to get medium, large, extra large, small trees of all the variety and place them around as well. Next, you're going to use your bushes, all right? Now, you're still on one layer, so you'll have to use your bracket keys to make sure that when you create and bring stuff in that they are in the correct order. They're not overlapping each other in very strange ways. But I want to see areas with all three. Maybe you've decided that the dry area gets more bushes than it does evergreen trees. Or uh, maybe there's an area that's very dense with rocks. You decided there's an area that um, is more of like a quarry. 
So go ahead and place a good variety throughout your map. Now that step is going to take you probably the longest out of every step, so it's okay if you feel like you've been there for a long time. All right, so your trees can be large or small, uh, they can be set densely or sparsely. Um, when you bring in your bushes, uh, have them overlapping some of the trees and rocks and also being overlapped by some of the trees and rocks as well, so we get a nice depth. All right, the next step in part three of Grow a Forest is to convert the following groups of objects into symbols, and then scatter them into the map to add ground texture. All right, they can even be placed in water. So we have one, two, three, four types of grass. Now the reason we do is because we have very different colors on our background layer. We have some lakeside colors, some plains colors, and dry colors. We also have water colors. So we have a type of grass that can be shown on the water. And we have two little groups of stones. Now again, you're gonna make all these into symbols before you bring them in. I know it's tempting to bring them in as just objects and then just duplicate them, but you will save yourself some file size and also how fast your computer can run the program by converting them into symbols first. All right, so let's go ahead and look at that on this map here. We'll turn on step 3D. All right, this adds lots more texture to those kind of blanker, blanker, more blank spaces in the illustration. All right, so we have over here, we have our dry grass showing up on our more dry colors. And then as soon as we get into like the plains green color, we use the plains grass. So you can see mine are here. There's the dry grass, there's the plains grass. And then we have lakeside grass. This grass is the greenest because it is the closest to the source of water. All right, so it just occurs close to the lake. And the last one we have is that water water grass. This can grow up out of the water. It's dark enough that it shows up, has enough contrast to be seen against the water, not only on the lake, but also in a couple areas along the river. All right, and then the stones have been placed in areas um, either next to other large stones or to fill up some kind of blank spaces around. Now, I've also used a couple of stones in the water as sort of um, almost like stepping stones to get to the raft. They could be used as stepping stones to get across the river as well. All right, that does it for growing a forest. I know I explained it fast, it will take longer for you, but now you kind of know what you're getting into. All right. Part four, this is the part that everybody is excited for. This one's called invite wildlife. All right, so you're gonna convert the following groups of objects into symbols and place them in areas of the map. So we have here a nice little, a nice little growth of mushrooms. Create a symbol out of those. See them over here in mine. We have a deer looking back over her shoulder, a deer looking forward, a deer eating, and an elk walking. Then we have three separate groups of what appear to be corvids, crows, or ravens of some kind. All right, now if this was your own illustration, you could add so much more variety of animals. Um, anything that you really desired, you could include. But I want you to go ahead and convert those each into a symbol so that they're in your symbol window. And then we'll add them into areas of your illustration. All right. In some cases, you may want the animal to appear alone or in a small herd. Um, again, alone or in a small flock. Crows are kind of uh, naughty sometimes, so I imagine they could start breaking into your camp or come check out your raft. They're very curious. Go ahead and scatter those animals, um, including your fungus, your little fungus growths, uh, into your map. Now there are fewer of these than there are of trees and rocks, um, and that's just the way of nature. There are fewer animals in an area than there are plants. All right. So go ahead and give yourself a few creatures, add some population in. All right, now your final step, which I don't have a layer for, I can turn this one to block off all that extra stuff. 
Your final step is to edit and adjust, and you can do this on both layers. Um, so right now you want to take the time to get particular about the size and the placement of your symbols. Um, you may want to add more in areas if the map feels kind of empty. Um, you may need to actually subtract a few if everything feels really crowded. If you got like really tree happy and added like way more trees and now you can't fit animals inside, um, you might think about thinning out your forest a little bit. Um, you also may want to start reflecting um, or varying the sizes of some of the symbols. If things feel a little bit too uniform, a little bit too predictably the same size, you can have medium and large deer, etc. Um, and again, just kind of an overview, by using symbols instead of copies of the groups, um, a large and complex illustration can stay a nice compact file size. Um, if by the end you would still want to add a little bit more ground texture, you're more than welcome to convert these groups here into symbols and sprinkle them over layer one. So if I were to call this ground one, ground two, and ground three, I can't spell today. Um, I could then come over into my map and just add, oops, of course I'm going to have to add it into a layer that, you won't have this problem, this is just my problem. I have just little areas of texture to break up the ground, make it feel like it's got either some stone or some dirt etc. Just kind of keeping things a little less flat. All right, I'm so excited to see how you do this differently than me. I do hope you do it very differently. Um, trying to replicate this would take longer than you should be taking on the assignment. Um, if you want to do an, uh, an illustration that has more uh, lakes or ponds or more rivers or more footpaths, that's totally fine too. So long as you include something from every step, um, you might not need as many bridges if your path only crosses the river once, um, but at least have one bridge in your illustration. All right, good luck. I'm so excited. Thank you.